Hello from Gardening at Dwensa here in Ireland. Now this video is about growing orchids but it's for people right at the beginning stage. We've all been there, we all remember it very well and there's a lot of mythology around orchids but there also are quite a few fussy things that you need to bear in mind when growing them. So if you already grow some plants and would like to take the plunge and buy your first orchid then this really is the video for you. So you want to grow orchids and I say welcome to the orchid club, you can do it. Now first things first, we need to go over some basics in orchid growing. There are a few, there are seven basics in total but bear with me and if you apply yourself to these and think about them there is absolutely no reason why you can't be very successful with a variety of orchids in your house. So the first thing to consider when growing orchids in a house environment is the temperature that you're going to keep them at. Now the majority of orchids that we grow in our home environment are tropical ones so they require a warmish temperature. But they're classified into three groups. So we have the warm growing orchids, we have the intermediate growing or orchids and the cool growing orchids. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means when you buy an orchid, you need to decide which category it fits into so that you can put it in the right room in your house to make sure it gets the temperature required. Now, the warm growing orchids, they can be grown anywhere between 21 and 29 degrees. And in that category, we have Phalaenopsis orchids, the moth orchid, which is the most common one grown in a house. And it's no wonder really, since many houses are warm to that temperature. The intermediate band encompasses orchids such as the Oncidium orchid, which I have over here. And this band runs from 18 degrees to round about 24. And I'm putting the conversion to Fahrenheit up above for anybody who's watching in America. So that's the intermediate temperature range for orchids and below that we have orchids that prefer to grow at a cooler temperature. Having said that, the minimum temperature for orchids generally speaking is 10 degrees centigrade. If you grow orchids lower than that for any prolonged period of time you're either going to kill the orchid or else you're going to weaken it so substantially that it's not going to be able to survive or it's going to succumb to a variety of diseases. Now, of course, there are always exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, we're going to take that 10 degree minimum as the minimum for orchids. And indeed, you wouldn't find many houses that would have a temperature lower than that. A couple of things to look out for when deciding where to site your orchid for the best temperature requirements in your house. And the first one is that if the orchid is pressed up too close to the glass on a window, it can actually freeze during uh, the night time when temperatures plummet. So just bear that in mind and try and have your leaves back from the glass. And also to monitor the temperature at that space right up against the window where you might be placing that orchid to get the best light. You do have to consider that if it gets colder there, the orchid's not going to like it. Also, when you place your orchids on a windowsill, if the orchid is placed over a radiator, well that really is going to dry it out very quickly. Now we'll come on to watering and humidity in a little while, but remember if an orchid is over a radiator, it may get far too warm and dry it out very quickly and you know that's not going to augur very well for the success of that plant on an ongoing basis. The second consideration when growing orchids is light and if you have an orchid and you've had it for a while and it won't flower then very often the reason for that is incorrect light. Now as with temperature the orchids have three categories of light requirements. So there are orchids that need high light, ones that need intermediate light and those that need low light levels. Now what do I mean by that? We're actually growing orchids in a house environment, a home environment. And when we talk about something that requires high light, 
Well, that really depends on the aspect of your house and what country you live in. I live in Ireland, we have low light levels here. But generally speaking, if an orchid has high light requirements, like the Vanda, for example, then it should be sited on a south-facing window. If the orchid has intermediate light requirements, like an Oncidium, then you're going to put it on an east-facing window. And if it's a low-light orchid, like the Phalaenopsis, then you're probably going to place that also on an east-facing window, but with a little shade or a little bit further back from the windowsill. But what you really have to do is play around with your orchids at different, um, at different windows. So, for example, in winter there's less light than in summer. If you have a Phalaenopsis on an east-facing window, slightly shaded, in summer, then in winter you're actually going to have to perhaps take away that shading to give the plant a little bit more light because there's less incumbent light in winter time. But always move your orchids gradually. So if for example you have a cattleya that hasn't been flowering for you and you have it on an east facing window, which some books will recommend, then you need to move it to a south facing window. But don't do it suddenly. Don't just in the middle of summer when you've got glaring sunshine out there, lift it up from a shady spot and plonk it on a sunny window so, because it will burn. You need to move them gradually. And also do give plants long enough in the one position to be able to assess whether it's working or not. Some people will tend to you know, move something around have it on an east facing window for a few days and think, oh my God, it's not flowering and move it somewhere else. And in that way, you learn absolutely nothing about your orchid's life requirements because you just haven't given it enough time to, to see what's going on. Now we're going to consider an orchid's watering requirements. And it'll come as no surprise that orchids fall into three categories when it comes to watering requirements. There are the orchids that prefer to be quite dry, such as the epidendrum here. And we can see from this that it really is quite dry down there in the potting mix. There are the orchids that like to remain moist, such as a variety of Oncidiums, and we can see that this one here is sitting in sphagnum and it's quite moist. And then there are the wet orchids, which are the ones that like to remain wet, such as the Phragmopedium here, which is actually sitting in water, as we can see from the drips there. All orchids, however, do require good drainage. So what they absolutely hate is that their roots are sitting in stagnant water for a long period of time. So in order to ensure that good drainage, but also to ensure that the particular orchid has the correct potting mix to hold on to moisture long enough for that particular orchid, what you need is a variety of potting mix and potting pots. Now there are various orchid mixes so for example this is the coarse grade bark and this is used, I use this for cattleyas for example which require a lot of good drainage and they certainly need to dry out between waterings. This one here is a medium orchid bark which I have used in, well, some smaller cattleyas and some oncidiums. And here we have, I suppose, what is a very fine orchid bark. And that we use for, well, smaller plants, essentially. What you can also use, and which I find really good for certain types of orchids, for example, ones that are in recovery and we're trying to grow their roots, and that is sphagnum moss which if we look in here, is that stuff in there? Now this is moss, a certain type of moss, and it has the great trait of holding water for a long period of time until it gradually dries out. So that's a medium that you can use. And in order to get that balance right between holding on to the right amount of liquid for that orchid, what you also have in your arsenal, let's say, is the type of pot you use. So 
Plastic pots, for example, are going to help hold the moisture in, whereas clay pots are porous and they're more likely to allow the plant to dry out more quickly. So now what we're going to do is work out whether our orchid needs watering or not. And there are two ways to do this. The first is to actually stick your finger down into the bark and feel how much moisture you can feel there. Now this is a bit tricky and it requires a bit of practice. Um, your finger should be able to judge what the water level is and from that, depending on the orchid type, whether you need to water or not. But generally speaking, you're looking for orchids to dry out between waterings. So that one, for example, is quite dry. I couldn't feel any moisture as far down as I could get, so it probably needs a watering. But another way, and a very good way for beginners to orchid growing, to work out whether their orchid needs watering or not, is to look at the roots. Now these Phalaenopsis have been potted in transparent pots and if you look through there you can see the plant's roots and this plant has green roots which means it's fully hydrated it doesn't need any water at this point in time whereas this Phalaenopsis also in a transparent pot has roots which are quite white see that there those long white roots that means that this plant could do with some water so the next thing we're going to do now is to actually water this plant Right, so you need to choose a good quality water for your orchids. Rainwater is best if you're not sure of how good your tap water is. And as with everything, there are two ways to water. The way I prefer is to actually pour the water through the top of the pot. So do you see here, there's a space between the plant and the bark there. And what I do is I take my jug of water and I pour it in there and do you see that? Do you see what's happening there? The water is running straight down the bottom of the pot. Now that's good. That means we have a fully free draining mix and in the majority of cases, in the vast majority of cases, that's exactly what you want for orchids. Now what I do is continue watering all the way around, making sure that every part of every inch of bark in that pot is thoroughly drenched and then that plant is watered. I would make sure that it drains completely and I would put it back in its place. But the second way to water is to actually place your orchid in a container, a watertight container, and just put water around the pot, filling up I suppose to about three quarters of the way up the, the inner pot, right? So, so this plant is now completely waterlogged, you can't see there, but the water level is about, about up to there. Now what I'll do is leave this sit for about 10 minutes to make sure that the bark absorbs every tiny bit of water that it can and the roots as well and then I'll come back in 10 minutes time and I will lift the plant up ensuring that everything drains away completely and toss the water and um, and then my plant is watered. So points to bear in mind when watering your orchid make sure not to spill any water on the leaves or in the crown of the plant and if you do get a piece of tissue paper and wipe it up immediately if water gets into the crown in phalaenopsis orchids like this one for example then it can lead to rot and dying so just watch out for that another important consideration when growing orchids in a house environment is humidity now orchids grow in a tropical environment where there's a lot of moisture hanging in the air and that's how they get a lot of their, of their water. But when we bring them to our homes and put them in an environment where there are radiators that come on and dry out the air all around, then you can be in trouble. What are the solutions? Now one solution would be to mist the plants, but generally speaking I don't find that works very well in a home environment. There are certain practicalities to having dripping water around the place. So what I use and what is 
generally recommended in a home environment is a humidity tray which is something like this you know so a tray that you might have for other garden purposes and it's filled up with clay pebbles which oops, which look like that and they sit in the tray and then what you do is just fill up the tray about two thirds of the way up with water like that and place your orchid on top. Now what happens in that instance is that the water gradually evaporates into the air raising the general humidity level and more specifically raising the humidity level around the plant that's directly above it. It works quite well. Like all growing plants, orchids need food. They need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, and they need potash. And they also need trace elements. Now, as orchids are grown in bark, they get very little in terms of nourishment from, um, from the bark. And that's fine, because orchids actually don't need a lot of food. And this really is quite key. If you overfeed your orchids, you will kill them. Now, you can buy a variety of orchid feeds from nurseries or from specialist sellers. Make sure what you give your orchids is for orchids and always follow the instructions. Most orchid feeds specify that the orchids should be fed once a month. Some specify a smaller amount still every week, but do do what it says on the packet. And flushing is important too, so to avoid a build-up of salts and other solids in your orchid bark from feeding, you need to flush the orchid through. And this is accomplished by feeding just once a month, and then the other three times that you water the orchid, you actually flush it through with fresh water. Orchids also need fresh air. And they need it for a variety of reasons. One, to make their stems strong and sturdy. One, to get rid of toxic vapour that might build up. Number three, it helps mix the air temperatures within a space. And just generally speaking, orchids that are exposed to good air movement suffer less from a variety of complaints like uh, botrytis and various kinds of rots. So if you're growing your orchids in a house, you might consider installing a fan just to move the air slightly, or you may consider opening a window. But do be careful in winter. If you open windows, then if the air is very cold outside and it comes blasting in on your orchids, creating a draft, that can be detrimental. Also, if your orchid is in bud, be very careful not to expose it to cold drafts because you're very likely to get bud blast in that instance. The next thing you need to consider when growing orchids is dormancy. And you need to respect any dormancy required by your orchids, which is why this dendrobium is coming into the frame now. Generally speaking, orchids are evergreen plants and therefore they don't go dormant in winter but some aren't. Now when a plant is dormant, and when an orchid is dormant, watering really should be kept to a minimum. With the orchids we grow in our houses normally, like Cattleyas, Phalaenopsis, Oncidiums, there isn't a specific winter dormancy, but in winter you need to reduce your watering ever so slightly. So whereas you might normally water every six days, in winter you're going to water say every seven or eight days. However, certain plants like the Dendrobium nobile we have in the frame here has a very pronounced winter dormancy, during which time it shouldn't be watered except in the case where the pseudobulbs shrivel. Now, you know, if you do continue to water this plant, you're probably not going to kill it. But what you will do is you'll probably stop it from flowering. And the whole point of growing orchids in the first place is to get those wonderful flowers. So you need to bear dormancy in mind and try your best to accommodate your plant's needs. 
And that brings us to the end of the seven essential elements in growing orchids. It might seem a bit complicated, but once you get your head around it, it will all seem a lot easier. And the important point is to keep lists. So make a list of the orchids that you have, and for each of them work out what light they require, what temperature they require, and whether they have resting periods. Basically go through the seven elements for each orchid and look over it and adjust as time goes on and you'll learn such a lot and if you do kill your first orchid don't give up I mean it happens you know the only really bad loss is when you kill an orchid and you learn absolutely nothing from it also what you need to take into account is that different houses are more conducive to certain types of orchids for some mad reason, I seem to do very well with cattleyas, which are highlight orchids in my particular home environment. So they're the orchids that I tend to favour, but you may find the Phalaenopsis do better for you. So you need to find that out by experimenting with different ones. And um, of course, what's also really important is to choose something that you absolutely love and absolutely adore the look of. because. You know, that's what's going to motivate you to learn more about the hobby and to try even better. So go on, do give it a go. And it just reminds me of a very old orchid joke that I heard and it's still true today. I mean, you know, you need to be patient with growing these plants, but the joke goes, how do you get a hundred orchids to be in flower all at the same time? Start with a thousand. That's all for now. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.